Manjula Padmanabhan is one of those rare authors I've talked about who's still alive, and whose name I'm pronouncing correctly. At least I'm pretty confident I am. Why? Yes, that's right. All this time, I've called myself MP because, secretly, I am Manjula Padmanabhan. Well, not really. Padmanabhan was born in 1953 to a pretty well-off family in Delhi, but as a young adult wanted to strike out on her own in the world. When I said to my parents at 21 that um, I didn't want any financial assistance and, and I wanted to live um, away from them, uh, I couldn't know what exactly I was um, uh, risking. And uh, in, in a sense, it was a good thing because had I known, I don't think I would have had the nerve to do it, but I didn't know. Leaving her bourgeois upbringing to spend years in relative poverty, she earned a living as an illustrator and with her newspaper comic strip, Suki. In 1997 came the turning point, kind of. Padmanabhan entered a play into something called the Onassis Cultural Competition for Theater and won, suddenly gaining an international reputation and, more importantly, perhaps, a quarter of a million dollars. With this alone, she became, according to a former professor of mine, India's most financially successful playwright. I would say I struggled for the 23 years all the way till harvest. Not many newspaper cartoonists who suddenly make a windfall in theater. India's literary culture is quite interesting, much like India, because of its multicultural character. In the language universe, India has at least 23, including English, which Padmanabhan writes in. No doubt her use of English loses potential local flavor and nuance that might be found in the literature of Hindi, Bengali, and other native Indian languages, but Padmanabhan actually spent many of her formative years living abroad before returning to India. So she writes from the perspective of being kind of an insider and outsider, Combined with her English, that has facilitated Padmanabhan's international appeal. And her English definitely has its own uh, eccentric flavor. I have three books of hers in my collection. They're all rich with irony and humor. Wish I'd formulated some genius unifying thesis beyond that, but with any luck, if I simply talk about these books, somebody will learn something. In my opinion, I'm presenting these books in order from worst to best. Might be an apples and oranges type situation, though. Double Talk is an anthology of that newspaper comic I mentioned, Suki. Suki's adventures were originally serialized in Bombay's Sunday Observer under the title Double Talk. Thus, the title of the book. Usually I dislike the rubbish plastered on back covers, but here the blurb boasts of close to 60 letters of complaint the Sunday Observer received. The speech balloons around the rim feature chunks of these letters. Kinda wish we could get the full text of at least one, but inside Double Talk is nothing like that. In the introduction, Padmanabhan writes that she based Suki's protagonist, Suki, off herself, and Suki's friends off friends she had at the time. Except the talking animals and the Martian, probably. Quote, she quickly established her own persona. I lived precariously as a paying guest, while she paid little attention to money, household chores, or any other practical matters. In fact, it was Suki who paid my rent by ensuring a trickle of income every month. If you ask me, contemporary funny pages are dreadful on almost every imaginable level. Suki challenges that assumption, well, less than I'd hoped, but more than I expected. Suki stands around disinterested, then notices the speech balloon above her head bombastically promoting the new wacky comic full of ribaldry. She tears the speech balloon down, outraged. My contract was for a serious comic strip, a socially committed comic, studious, sober, intellectual, boring. In short, anything but funny. Suki rushes off to the scriptwriter to complain, reaching her door in a borderless panel for some reason. But it turns out, <gasps> the disinterested writer is identical to Suki. Like Padmanabhan said, she and Suki started off as the same person. Thwarted social progressivism, self-deprecation, and meta-humor about the newspaper comic medium? We're living up to those letters of complaint so far. 
even if the characters seem to live in barren voids. But we already have another strike against this book. The newspaper comics were printed in color. You can see that on the cover. But inside, they're all black and white. I understand. Color printer ink is as pricey as unicorn blood. Penguin Random House had a choice between making a more expensive and therefore more inaccessible book, or between making one that didn't look as nice, and I think they probably made the right decision. I expect Suki and Padmana Ban began to diverge around page 5, when Suki dresses as a cabaret girl in response to reader demand for a dirtier comic. She delivers a feminist critique of her goofy outfit, and then responds to a feminist critique of the previous comic by explaining to a feminist character that she wants to use humor to bring light to social issues rather than to laugh at them, but then returns to her former wardrobe. Which is just kind of baggy everything. The meta-comedy just keeps coming, with inventive strips that feature Suki interfering with the physical comic panel and medium themselves. At this point, Padmanaban and Suki are definitely no longer the same person. After all, by page 13, Suki thinks about a light bulb as the cartoon shorthand for having an idea, you know, like a light bulb turns on above your head, but then her friend's able to touch the light bulb. That probably never happened to Padmanaban. Although, complicating the division somewhat, Suki herself uses the antics with the light bulb as an idea for the comic strip. So she's also the scriptwriter. Not only is this one meta, but it also features a plot twist and a time loop, not to mention cute denim trousers. This is so much more than you'd expect from a comic strip. This is my kind of humor. Sadly, it only keeps up to about page 20, when Suki takes a trip to London. Afterwards, the comic has its moments, but Double Talk's jokes are much more standard sitcom-esque hijinks. And even before, there are a few stinkers. Like a comic where Suki just screams? By page 26, the artwork's shifted. Apparently, Padmanaban began drawing the comic in less detail, both to facilitate comic drawing and because it looks better. I'm not sure I agree with the looking better part, but I do prefer the straight-edged panels and the watercolors. I'm sure I'd like those colors even better if they weren't, you know, grayscale. Also worth appreciating is that Suki now occasionally hangs out in spaces other than empty voids that instantly inspire existential dread. I mean, the lines are uh, kind of un irregular, and more than anything else, the script is kind of unreadable. Uh, you're seeing it up big on a screen, but this appeared in a newspaper, and it, it was not easy to read. Another quirk of Double Talk, much worse than the grayscale, is the pixelation. I'm not sure how well this will turn out in the video, but unless the original published comic strips were always shoddy, they should have scanned them at a higher resolution for the book. Instead, they're all pixely. This might be the worst thing a book of artwork could be. This is probably a criticism of Double Talk itself, though, rather than Suki overall. Suki features minor narrative arcs. However, these aren't whole-out stories with dramatic stakes or plotting, like, for example, in E.C. Cigar's old Thimble Theater comics. In one story arc, for example, Suki decides to meditate to obtain divine powers and sprouts an extra set of arms, like Lakshmi or Vishnu, which is pretty funny. The forearm story arc only lasts from page 40 to page 43, ending with a political disarmament pun. It's less a story arc and more a series of jokes on the same theme, which just drops away as soon as Padmanaban wants to start cracking new jokes. I think I know what happened here. When Suki became a daily rather than weekly comic, Padmanaban could explore these concepts over several days rather than over eight or so panels. These stories don't exist for the sake of storytelling, but as vehicles for the gags. The longest story arc in Double Talk involves Suki's efforts to escape a Martian who looks like a walking sausage. Yeah, Suki is pretty... not weird, although it is that too, but random? Or, if you're feeling more charitable, whimsical. The Martian story arc might not be especially long, since quite a few comics happen in between the start and conclusion that are unrelated to it, but from the start to the conclusion is a whopping 24 pages! Granted, after reading Paradise Lost, 24 pages isn't that impressive. By the way, that frog Suki's talking to becomes one of her primary recurring friends. 
Speaking of her friends, one of them is a snarky bearded guy. I don't think he, or anyone except Suki for that matter, is ever given a name. This is a bit of a tangent, but let me say something that bothers me about comedy. Okay, in this strip, Suki tells the bearded guy about a recurring nightmare in which she's pursued by a bull. Simultaneously, a bull hilariously charges from the terrifying white void towards Suki. But the final three panels reveal that the bearded guy realized the bull was charging at Suki all along. Then the next strip has Suki hospitalized, telling the bearded guy, I broke both my arms, was gored in the stomach, and have multiple rib fractures, and may never walk properly again. Then the beard man just makes a joke about how he really wants to know whether the bull was injured. I get that this is cartoon slapstick, but I've always been disturbed when characters in comedy stories are unforgivable monsters, but the story doesn't seem to care. If he didn't see the bull coming and then made a little joke to lighten up the mood, that'd be one thing, but this is at least second degree assault. A lot of comedies feature an unsympathetic character whose buffoonery and comeuppance we laugh at, but that isn't what's going on here. This guy got his friend gored by a bull. But look at him! He doesn't care! Frankly, Beardman is an irredeemable asshole, and every time I saw him for the rest of the book, I felt disgusted. All sarcasm aside for a second, my takeaway from the Bull comics is more like reading a horror story about a sociopath abusing his friends than amusement at a few gags. To be fair, Suki lets her dog Jaws torment Beardman later on, so Padmanaban deals out some justice. No wonder Suki starts hanging out with a talking frog instead. My favorite bits in Double Talk don't feature Suki or her friends at all. A couple strips concern a flower, the text appearing in its thought bubbles. The flower's field is flooded. Oh no. It begins to call itself a coral reef. In the next comic, the flower speaks aloud to a butterfly, who jokes it's a seagull, and lands on the flower to drink nectar. It's all cute and sweet, Enough so that it feels even more disconnected from the rest of Double Talk's selection. These flower strips have a quirky beauty about them. Is that just me? Am I looking too hard into this? The flower returns for two more comic strips, which are also charming, but don't recapture the magic of the coral flower and the butterfly. I've actually met a newspaper comic artist, Jim Borgman. I was a little kid and remember almost nothing about it, but his artwork on Zitz is better than anything in Double Talk here. But Padmanabhan's writing is much weirder than Jerry Scott's and socially conscious, so it more than balances out. If Suki's more droll than funny, maybe that's okay. What does Padmanabhan herself think on the subject? I don't think I produce uh, cartoons that are, that, that are laugh-worthy, but I, I aim for a little tickle in, in the mind. I don't care for the characters, jokes, artwork, or well, any part of Double Talk. Except those flower comics. Should frame those and hang them on the wall. Even so, I have to admire Suki for the sheer novelty. A gag comic strip depicting the surreal adventures of an Indian feminist journalist. If you'd like to learn more about Suki, there's a YouTube video called Suki Speaks, uploaded by someone who might be Padmanabhan herself? <laughs> Suki is informative, but her production effort here is kind of shoddy. But she's a comic character. What do you expect? She couldn't give a voiceover, she has to speak in speech balloons. <laughs> Same publisher and year as Double Talk, huh? Although, like every book in this video, UNPRINCESS is only a paperback, coating these shiny plastic covers are colorful illustrations. I question the seemingly random composition, but it definitely grabs your attention and accurately represents the goofy fun inside. Everything you see here appears in the stories. That includes the man wearing a python like a turban, the schoolgirl duck, and this machine wad. Which one of these girls is the unprincess herself? None of them! Unprincess is a children's book. We might consider this a representative work, because Padmanabhan has a long career in children's literature. This one consists of three modern-day fairy tales starring proactive young girls. Whimsical and feisty, the back cover calls them. Padmanabhan, in addition to doing the writing, also gives us the extensive illustrations. 
Every page is as much drawing as text, the pictures as goofy as the words. The artwork might seem simplistic, but as someone engaged in a comparable project, I assure you that an enormous amount of work went into this slim volume. The first story is The Giant and the Unprincess. A bus full of schoolchildren drifts down the streets of New Delhi when a giant appears and prepares to eat them. A giant with acne and striped eyebrows. A summary does no justice to Padmanabhan's writing. Almost every other sentence is a joke. Quote, then he put the bus down altogether and proceeded to peel its top off. He did this as easily as you or I might peel the lid off a tin of sardines, or the foil off a new jar of Nescafe, or even the tab off a, well, you get the picture. Easily. None of these activities was well received by the occupants of the bus. <laughs> um, when the giant peels the roof off the school bus, all the princes and princesses on board react uselessly. The princes all start playing video games, and the princesses all scream. The bus driver and conductor panic. What shall we do, shouts the driver. My contract never said anything about answering questions of this nature, says the conductor. I'm told nothing like this ever happens abroad. Because they're responsible adults, these guys get drunk on rum and pass out. Whole sequence is hilarious. Only Kavita, the titular unprincess, takes action. She stalls the giant with questions about how he'll store the human meat. I like her bulbous knees. As a video game man, I have to object to this line. Quote, They all whipped out their trusty Nintendos and Game Boys. I can accept these blocks of soap in the boys' hands as Game Boy Advance units, but the phrasing clearly means the boys have separate Nintendos and Game Boys. What non-Nintendo Game Boy are we talking about exactly? Are we to believe the kids are plugging Game Cubes into portable TVs? Um, Padmanabhan seems to take the princes for useless dolts and the princesses for trained damsels in distress. When Kavita raises the possibility of them being skewered for the giant's hors d'oeuvres, these girls' main concern is whether the giant's cling film will work as a party dress. I appreciate any insult directed at royal titles, though it feels odd since these seem to be normal school kids. Maybe the sense is they're kind of rich? I'm not familiar enough with New Delhi to know if that's an implication here. In a heroic sacrifice, Kavita lets the giant take her in return for releasing everyone else. Why don't you save yourself a whole lot of trouble and take only one of us out of this bus? Then the police won't come after you or anything. She paused, thinking quickly. Well, not just for one child, or else we might begin to think that the police were actually efficient. Though she's also genuinely curious what kind of house a giant lives in. In the shocking twist ending, mayonnaise and chocolate turn out to be a tasty combination. Additionally, the giant's actually a normal lonely boy named Ash who was just messing around. His size and attack were only illusions generated with a pirated version of Windows 98. The story's funny, charming, nails that fairy tale style, and features, I guess, a nice moral, having Kavita's curiosity and bravery pay off with a new friend. Combined with the cute illustrations, definitely a winner. That's basically my assessment of the rest of the book. The second story, Sweet Fantasy, is the weakest. The opening sentence is amazing, though. Come with me, please, said the tall man dressed in a silver safari suit. I like that Padmanabhan decides the man's most striking features are his height and silver safari suit, and not the white python he's wearing as a turban. Basically, Sweet Fantasy is the international company responsible for distributing dreams to sleepers, and the company sent this man to bring a girl named Sayoni to save them from a terrifying nightmare. Sayoni, you see, enjoys happy dreams on her own without Sweet Fantasy's involvement and so is invaluable to them in this situation. Most of us just naturally have bad dreams. Guess that means I'll never meet a man with a snake turban. Given her centrality on the cover, you might expect the schoolgirl duck to play an important role. We meet her in the Midnight Bazaar dream world, along with a bunch of other duck school kids. But they're only around for a couple of pages, and they're wedged between the text such that you can barely see them. What a shame. I want duck schoolgirl adventures. Give me a whole duck schoolgirl novel. The nightmare is a monster. 
It has, among other things, three heads and seven butts, and excretes rotting hamburgers. Artfully, Padmanabhan avoids drawing any but a small portion of it, which lets her create a delightfully wacky description of something more or less impossible to illustrate. Sayoni tames the monster no problem. Oh, come on, said Sayoni. It's not real. Not like a terrorist. The final and longest story is my personal favorite in Unprincess, Ermila the Ultimate. When Ermila was born, she was so exceptionally ugly that five nurses fainted before the sixth one had the presence of mind to wear protective goggles before picking her up. Needless to say, her mother, like all mothers, could see nothing in the least amiss with her child, but the friends and relatives who arrived at the clinic to greet the newborn walked right out again without saying a word. Many went straight to their therapists, or reached for bottles of antidepressants, to recover from the shock of seeing such a spectacularly homely child. Fortunately, Ermila's parents love her just the way she is. Ermila has no problem with herself, either. I can't emphasize enough that Ermila is the kindest, brightest kid in the world. Note that Ermila's parents are named Ermila's mother and Ermila's father, capitalized so those are definitely their names. This leads us to the first challenge Ermila's parents face, finding her a school. When the arrogant principal of the extremely prestigious Sunshine Heights sees Ermila's face, she screams. This is where Padmanabhan seems to lose track of the premise, with Ermila's ugliness becoming less an exaggeration and more a supernatural power. Her false eyelashes melted and fused together so that she went temporarily blind. Her nail polish burst into flames. I don't care how ugly your horror nightmare face is, looking at it won't cause that to happen, or rifles to whip around like eels. After all these years, Ermila's kind-hearted parents never realized their daughter's face is the supernatural power. The peanut vendor Sultan Ali reveals the truth. Your daughter is ugly to the max, so ugly that the tree has not yet been planted that will be used to make the cradle in which will sleep the baby who will grow up to be the wordsmith who will coin the term that can bear the full weight of your daughter's asthma-inspiring hideosity. Remember the machine wad on the cover? Why, well, here are a couple of them. They are enemy satellites that Sultan Ali worries might be watching Ermila, the ultimate weapon. Clearly, Padmanabhan takes a Dr. Seuss approach to satellites, as opposed to a realism approach. Here we learn why the story wears the title it does. Excuse me, said her mother, but I'm finding it difficult to use this four-letter word that has become so popular in the last half hour to describe my one and only treasure, my perfect child. I suggest that henceforward we insist on the use of a substitute word to describe you, she said to Ermila. How about... ultimate? Of course, Padmanabhan never shows us Ermila's, er, ultimate face. We see her shoelaces, though. This moment might be corny, but I think it's important for comedy to have these moments of sincerity. Otherwise, it risks becoming ungrounded, mean-spirited, like with that beard guy. At this point, Ermila the Ultimate pivots into military slapstick. Acting on a suggestion from Sultan Ali, and thinking it would be fun, Ermila asks her parents to convey her to the Ministry of Defense. I'm a fan of stories with grotesque military officials, which might account for why this is my favorite part of the book. <laughs> is he all right? Uh, he sweats rather a lot, sir. Who is he? <laughs> all right, men, in view of the extreme heat, you may all undo the top button of your tunic. <laughs> the senior generals decide to wield Ermila as a, quote, weapon of mass horrification. There's nothing in the Geneva Conventions against horrification. Even the Americans will have no grounds to object. As if the American military has any moral ground to object to much of anything. Reminds me of Monty Python's The Funniest Joke in the World, but with less murder. And we soon had the joke by January in a form which our troops couldn't understand, but which the Germans could. To goad India into launching their ultimate weapon that they might learn its secrets, the enemy, only ever identified as proper noun, the enemy, field an army, 
This brings us to the funniest moment in the whole book, when these soldiers, as part of their macho tough guy antics, lift weights with their nose hairs. The illustration is standout. Simple but effective. Suffice to say, Ermila's irresistible ultimateness engulfs the enemy army, and the Indian army too, in mayhem of biblical proportions. People bouncing off walls, rifles coming to life and becoming a new species of eel. Honestly, Ermila's probably some kind of god descended in human form. Looks like Ermila's parents are as perplexed as I am. Ermila's ultimateness reduces both sides of the conflict to the same level. The only difference between them and the enemy was that their uniforms turned saffron rather than pink. In this way, Ermila is a great equalizer, and the absurdity of war is laid bare. All the soldiers vow never to fight again and become artists, and Ermila returns to her parents. Here, on the last page of Unprincess, Padmanaban pulls a Mark Twain and frames Ermila the Ultimate as a story she heard from somebody else. In this case, that peanut vendor Sultan Ali who turned up earlier. One wonders how Padmanaban learned about the giant and the unprincess, or sweet fantasy. Ermila uses her magic abilities to fight cancer and cell phone service providers, serving the world far better than she could in the military, and leads a fulfilling social life online. She wears a thick black veil and looks like any one of the millions of burqa-clad women around the world. She has a big, sunny house not far from where I live, and enjoys a happy, normal life. There the book ends, on a happy note. And also a warning not to mess with women in burqas. You never know what you're going to find underneath. In not even a hundred pages, Padmanaban packs a ton of fun. Or at least a few minutes worth. For a grown-up, this is one short book. Unprincess uses many words I don't expect to find in children's books, though, including bourgeois, incontinence, and Madonna Rocket Bra. It's so much funnier than Suki, and also more kid-friendly, that I'm surprised it's from the same author. Is Unprincess a masterpiece to join the ranks of Tagori and Shakespeare? Well, no, obviously. Doesn't intend to be. Unprincess is the literary equivalent of, say, a Super Mario game. The goal is family-friendly fun and nothing else, but boy is it fun. Double Talk and Unprincess share many similarities. Girls in empowered roles, a strong sense of irony, a satirical bent, cartoon drawings, jokes as the top priority. The final book in this video will carry on three of these traits. Another dang flimsy paperback, though the contents are what matters. I'm still not entirely sure what these white globes on the cover are meant to be, Probably the receiver that Genie uses to communicate with the family, except doubled for some reason. Also, I've never seen such a draconian copyright on any book. All rights are strictly reserved. They say you cannot reproduce any part of this book whatsoever without the publisher's consent. Usually, there'll be at least an exception noted for review purposes. I'm tempted to, scandalous, show photos of some pages anyway, I doubt the folks at Aurora Metro Press will ever see this video, but eh, let's err on the side of caution and put some other stuff on in the background. Harvest is the play that won Padmanaban, the Onassis Cultural Competition for Theater. Interestingly, the back cover indicates the play was first performed in Greek. So, Harvest debuted as an Indian play written in English, then translated into Greek for a performance in Athens. Hmm. Um, as a woman playwright from the developing world, uh, I fit a certain slot, and it becomes kind of interesting to invite me for that reason. I'm not, you know, I'm not presuming here, I think. I think that's just how things happen. And I'm grateful to Harvest, so it's, I'm not putting it down. Harvest. With a title like that, you expect a play about rural life, set during a rice harvest or something. Nope. As in her other works, Padmanaban knows irony. It might be Padmanaban's magnum opus, a three-act family drama in a sci-fi dystopia replete with filthy language, sex, horror, bereaved screams, and existential despair. Slightly different from Double Talk and Unprincess, Harvest concerns a working-class family in Mumbai. A young man named Om Prakash 
his wife Jaya Kumar, his teenage brother Jitu Prakash, and his 60-year-old mother Indumati, whose name in the Dramatis Personae is Ma. They live together in a one-room flat. Typically of a family in contemporary theater, all of them more or less hate each other's guts. Except for Act 1, Scene 3, which features Jaya rendezvousing with Jitu on the roof of the tenement, the play confines the action entirely to the family's room. What's the plot? Act 1 begins with Jaya and Ma in the flat, talking about Ohm and whether he's gotten the job. Jaya hopes he hasn't, for which opinion her mother-in-law viciously harangues her. Ohm returns. He got it. He got the job. Ma says, Ah, my soul, my heartbeat! Come, kiss me, let me hold you, fondle your ears! As we gather over the remainder of Act 1, Ohm was the breadwinner of a family barely holding on to begin with, but was laid off. Desperate to escape hunger and eviction, Ohm signs a contract with international company Interplanta to become a donor. This might qualify as Ohm's legal consent, but a contract forged out of crushing poverty is hardly genuine consent. Interplanta's militant automaton-like minions, the guards, storm into the flat to install a computer globe called the Contact Module and inform the family of the terms of Ohm's contract. To qualify for the donor program, Ohm feeds the guards a major lie, that Jaya is his sister. Adding to the incestuous atmosphere is Jaya's affair with her brother-in-law. Thanks to Ohm, Interplanta believes he's her husband anyway. On the contact module appears the Receiver, the blonde and white-skinned epitome of an American-style youth goddess, Virginia, or Jeannie for short. In tones of friendly, naive condescension, Jeannie mispronounces names and shows complete ignorance about India and the lives of this family whose breadwinner has sold them to her. Interplanta is a North American company that harvests organs from people in developing countries and ships them to the rich folks of the developed world, the West. I'll be using those phrases, developing world and the West, because they're standard terms. I've never liked that terminology, though. Both are part of the same world system, and the relationship of West and East is much more complex than a binary. But those are the terms. For the purposes of Harvest, I take India as representative of the developing world, and Genie's country, seemingly the United States, as representative of the West. Padmanabhan depicts the West as dominating the developing world both in wealth and physical force. Though his family lives in such poverty that Ohm accepts selling his organs as a viable financial solution, Jeannie wallows in such opulence she casually pays for plumbing, television, and other radical renovations to the flat. Ma and Jaya hate each other so much, and their poverty presses so hard upon the whole family that the flat was already a pressure cooker, but the introduction of Jeannie's renovations pushes the family over the edge. Their bodily ruin parallels their moral one. Interplanta mandates that the Prakesh family not leave their flat, at risk of contaminating Ohm, and feeds them a diet of cartoonish colorful capsules. I want to be clear about this. Harvest is a bleak tale with ponderous economic themes, but it's still Padmanabhan who wrote it. The play is drenched in irony, and hilarious. But you'd rather live in this small room, I suppose. Think it's such a fine thing living day in, day out like monkeys in a hot case, lulled to sleep by our neighbor's rhythmic farting, dancing to the tune of the melodious traffic, and starving. There's a proper fart joke, as part of a genuinely heavy speech about poverty, no less. Act 1, Scene 3, mentioned earlier, reveals that Jaya is having an affair with Jitu, who's run away from home and become a sex worker. While he fingers her to orgasm, they discuss the empty falsehoods of their lives. Padmanabhan links G2 selling sex to Ohm literally selling his body. At least when I sell my body, I decide which part of me goes into where and whom. But it's the money in the end, isn't it? My poor brother. Thought he was so pure. But he's like everyone else after all, only as pure as the price of his rice. Ohm has prostituted himself orders of magnitude beyond what any sex worker could do. 
Act 2 occurs two months after Act 1, when the families become habituated to Jeannie's patronage, the neighbors' constant harassment, and their own inhuman antiseptic lifestyle. A nice touch is that at this point, Ohm starts wearing those kind of gym shoes that light up when you take steps, like he's a kid or something. Another of Padmanabhan's thumbprints comes in the way the dialogue's written. The liberal use of N dashes instead of M dashes, lines of dialogue like, Arrgh! the occasional double exclamation point. These all suggest the looser writing typical of comics more than the supposedly literary style of most plays and novels. Then, catastrophe, dressed in rags, coated in mud and oozing sores, G2 returns and brings big drama with him. His small steps into the flat are a giant leap over the stringent sanitation standards Interplanta requires of a donor. This and the next scene feature G2 almost reveling in the decay of his body. These scenes have stuck with me as few scenes in anything have. When I think of Harvest, I think of G2 shouting about freedom and about a dog urinating into his mouth. And you, my mother, I hear your love for me has been bought for the price of a flush toilet. When you reach my age, you'll know that a peaceful shit is more precious than money in the bank. G2 is the match that lights the trash fire. The family tears into each other, arguing about whether to shun G2 and what'll happen if Interplanta discovers their domestic unit contaminated. It escalates to death threats, and the suspense builds and builds. After a fake-out, the guards arrive. In a breathless and horrifying scene, Ohm cowers in the toilet stall, allowing the guards to mistake G2 for their donor. Jaya attempts to save her lover, but Ma, who's hated G2 from the start, her own son, eggs the guards on. Without helping them, of course. At this point, she never leaves her chair. The guards recite some corporate speak and leave with their quarry. The company doesn't kill G2. When they return him, they've taken his eyes. It doesn't wake Ma. Her cruelty and selfishness are so despicable that, at different parts of the play, her character is used to provoke laughter, to disturb us, and both simultaneously. In this case, it's the disturb us part. In Act 3, the family is culled one by one. G2 begins bitter, as he damn well should be, and remains defiant towards his family and Genie both. Then Genie restores his sight. She transports him, as in a VR game, to meet her face to face. Or simulated face to face. You can see all of me right in front of you. All of me for once, not just my face. Well, what do you think? It's... you're... beautiful. Like... magic. Magic. As though by magic, the goddess, nearly nude in her palace, seduces G2, and his resistance sloughs off like his eyes. He gladly allows the guards to take him away for Genie's harvest. As for Ma, three automaton-like people called the Agents deliver a gadget she's ordered with the Interplanta money, something called the Super Deluxe Video Couch. Padmanabhan's description in the stage directions suggests a cartoonish machine like those spy satellites from Unprincess, here to somewhat more sinister effect. It is reminiscent of Tutankhamun's sarcophagus, encrusted with electronic dials and circuitry in the place of jewels. Note that the video couch is likened to Tutankhamun's sarcophagus. The occupant of the video couch can remain on their back indefinitely, streaming 750 channels for their amusement. While the agents remain to prevent Ohm and Jaya from stopping her, Ma voluntarily seals herself inside. It is a coffin. If this were written today, presumably there'd be internet access or something instead of TV channels, but the point is the same. You can choose from Star Wars, Marvel, or DC characters to stare at while you lay in a coffin waiting for your body to rot. Tell us all about what the Media Edition Nerd Coffin is. Well, Nerd Coffin will install a Wi-Fi enabled flat screen television directly into your coffin. I've stopped caring about anybody, Ma says before the lid of the video couch seals. How's that for atomized individualism? As for Ohm, for his cowardice in letting the guards take G2, he suffers pangs of regret. He voluntarily turns himself over to Interplanta, promising Jaya he will return. He doesn't. 
Normally, the back cover blurb tries to sell the reader on the hook, but here we have a summary of the whole story. It gives away everything. This description makes it sound like Harvest's main conflict's whether Jaya will sell herself to the Westerners, but that's the conflict for literally only the last few pages. Maybe this is normal for stage plays, to give away the whole story? I suppose the intended audience, after all, would be watching a performance rather than reading this script. In any case, for the final scene, only Jaya remains. Harvest is definitely a page-turner. I can only imagine it'd be great on stage, too. But this final scene is so thematically dense that it carries the play. A man's voice comes from the contact module. A projection appears of his body. And he is Jitu. Or rather, he's occupying Jitu's body. Here we reach the twist. Genie never existed. She was a computer-animated wet dream. The receiver was an American man named Virgil. He knew that Ohm meant to trick him about his marriage status. He knew the guards took Jitu instead of Ohm. From the beginning, his target was Jaya and Jaya alone. And the organ he seeks is her uterus. The developing world is powerless before the West. That is, before the guards and the agents and the corporations they represent. Resistance is useless, as the guards tell Jaya. Interplanta feeds Ohm and his family like mice in a cage with plastic-like pellets shaped like goat shit. Jaya says that Genie maintains Ohm as beef cattle. Jaya evokes imagery of Genie eating the poor. Ohm's description of the Interplanta facility he visits, with a moving floor funneling thousands of naked men to receive injections and showers, suggests animals in an industrial farm or robot-prodded products on conveyor belts. Interplanta treats Ohm and his family as commodities rather than people. The Prakesh family is barely worthy of the name. Ma is brutally lazy and selfish, never getting up from her corner, and speaking to her daughter-in-law and her own son Jitu with extreme invective, before sealing herself away in entertainment the West has provided. Jitu abandons Ohm and Ma to live in the streets, and they, in turn, abandon him. He states he has no standards, so long as he is paid. Ohm shows little regret for sacrificing his brother's eyes to Genie, perverting his wife into his sister, and selling himself to a rich foreigner. Though he has a change of heart, his sacrifice apparently yields nothing. This extreme of moral and bodily ruin is the result of desperate circumstances. Judging from their introductions in the opening scene, even before Ohm was laid off, the family's inability to live securely precluded morality. Ethics are for those with a full belly. It always returns to money. We've got to have money. Harvest is a play deeply concerned with the groundwork of all human societies, economics. Desperation leaves Ohm prepared to ignore all other concerns. As G2 said, like everyone else, Ohm is only as pure as the price of his rice. This desperation is part of capitalism, a feature not a glitch type deal. Poverty doesn't come from nowhere. There are no riches for Virgil unless there are those from whom those riches are systematically harvested. Poverty for the developing world is what the West wants. In Virgil's own words, Unless they're desperate, they won't do as we say. Virgil, rather Virgil and G2's body, rather, a projection of Virgil and G2's body, explains to Jaya that, in the West, there are no children. We began to live longer and longer, and healthier each generation, and more demanding. Soon there was competition between one generation and the next, old against young, parent against child. We older ones had the advantage of experience. We prevailed, but our victory was bitter. We secured paradise at the cost of birds and flowers, bees and snakes. So we designed this program. We support poorer sections of the world while gaining fresh bodies for ourselves. This is the only explanation we get. Immortality isn't guaranteed, but Virgil's wealth enables him to harvest body after body until he finds one that will remain stable. This scene is as dense as a black hole. The West, let's be clear, capitalism, has mechanized every aspect of life. 
That technology can no longer build a future, but only take from the developing world, which the West supports only to enable this plundering and keep itself on life support. An infertile society as a metaphor is of great interest to me, which isn't entirely fair. After all, infertility's no moral failing. Plenty of people simply can't have kids, and that's okay. With that acknowledged... Very odd. What happens in a world without children's voices? A culture without children is a dead mass. It can produce nothing new. Moribund capitalist civilization is one with no children, with no positive future, where people can imagine no alternative, which can only end when humanity itself dies out. So it is framed. The late Mark Fisher wrote a short book about the phenomenon. Fisher uses the movie Children of Men as a jumping-off point, and Children of Men depicts a future in which nobody can reproduce. Too late. World went to shit. You know what? It was too late before the infertility thing happened, for fuck's sake. Children of Men, spoilers, I guess, ends with hope. An African woman, Key, gives birth and escapes the oppressive British government. Fuck you staring at. Children of Men suggests that the solution to the despair of the West lies among those it has marginalized. So too does Harvest. Virgil is a supernatural phantom that steals bodies and souls. Hell, as other form, genie, sounds like genie, and is also called a goddess. In Harvest, Padmanabhan represents Western power as inhuman, like gods or spirits. Jaya refuses to let Virgil inseminate her, not unless he makes the journey to meet her in person, and pronounce her name correctly while he's at it. She wields her last remaining weapons against him, her body and her pride. After destroying the contact module, Jaya vows to kill herself if the guards bother her, or if she runs out of caffeine pills before Virgil arrives. Though Jaya will probably die, the moral victory is hers. From the beginning, despite cheating on her husband, Jaya has been a voice of reason and the most likable character. She's also been the most harangued and ignored member of the family, nothing but a dried-up coconut shell for Ohm to scrape out and kick aside. In the final twist, though, it turns out Jaya, this minority of a minority, held the power all along. Evidently, the West has annihilated the developing world's previous hierarchy, opening a path for someone like Jaya. What's that imply about our world? I'm not sure. The basic premise of Harvest is true. The developed world exploits the developing world for resources and labor, getting away with shameful crimes. That includes organ trafficking. This makes Harvest the second book I've talked about that involves the trade in human organs. In an earlier video, I inanely waffled on about Karen Te Yamashita's novel, Tropic of Orange. I didn't say much on the subject back then, but human organ trafficking is a serious problem in the world today. This 2017 BBC article, for example, describes one Abu Jafar who arranged for Syrian refugees in Beirut to sell organs to rich people or at least people rich enough to buy them. They usually ask for kidneys, yet I can still find and facilitate other organs, he says. They once asked for an eye, and I was able to acquire a client willing to sell his eye. I took a picture of the eye and sent it to the guys by WhatsApp for confirmation. I then delivered the client. Lone traffickers like Abu Jafar are far from a well-funded corporation like Interplanta, but isn't it the same phenomenon? Desperate people selling their own organs with the help of modern technology, WhatsApp, so their families can afford food. Padmanabhan paints the world in bleak colors, but that's because it is bleak. This vision of the Prakesh family's destruction inside a single room exemplifies what fiction does so well, presenting complex issues in a punchy, easily understood way. Quite an accomplishment for only 92 pages. That means Double Talk's been the longest of this video's three books, barely scraping past 100. I'm going to show you them as separate frames because I liked the dogs so much. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I particularly liked the pink poodle. I've presented all the Padmanabhan in my collection, but if I've piqued your interest, here are all the books she's published. I think she's currently working on a dystopian novel series, so Harvest wasn't a genre fluke. 
As of December 2019, Suki is still syndicated in the newspaper Hindu Business Line under the new name Skiaki. I appreciate the pun. This woman has the cutest hair.